Hi there. Big news just came out for House of the Dragon this morning, which strongly seems to indicate when the season one finale endpoint will be within the story. What is the stopping point that they're covering through the end of the season? New casting information very strongly indicates that we will be getting the dance at Storm's End. The first dragon versus dragon fight of the war, the first blood of the war, when Allison's son Amond fights Rhaenyra's son Luke on their dragons, and it happens at Storm's End because they're both trying to get House Baratheon on their side. The casting update was for one of Boros Baratheon's four daughters. Now, this is sort of a sequel to a previous video I did where we already had one daughter cast, uh, played by an actress named Emma O'Hara, but it didn't say specifically which character she was playing. She's credited as Boros Baratheon's daughter without a name. She was using the casting website Mandy.com. We just found a second daughter listed on a different agency that lists information differently, Spotlight.com, lists actress Laura Lake as playing Ellen Baratheon. And it gives more information that it actually says who is directing the episode she's in. Greg Yatani's. They've been following my channel. I've been... The information builds on previous information. I said, why am I meticulously going through the schedule of which director is doing which episode? And I said at the time, so when they list which, which actors are appearing in which episodes, we can kind of get a sense of the timeline for the story. And this bore fruit here that... If one of Boros Baratheon's daughters is in a Greg Gaetani's episode, what is the timeline for those? From other things, from, this is corroborated with other crew members like the, the cinematographer's CVs list what they're in. We're pretty sure that Greg Gaetani's is directing episodes 2 and 3 and then 10. That he is directing episode 10, the finale, and Boros Baratheon's daughters aren't alive at the time frame of episodes 2 and 3. That... We've seen young Rhaenyra through episode five in spy photos that they they're not they haven't been born yet I don't think or they're small children they wouldn't be played by a twenty year old so because it's before the time skip there's no way that Boros Baratheon's daughter would appear in episode two or three and that we've already established this director list is accurate the director schedule is accurate even though it doesn't list the episode on her profile we know from the character she's playing. Boros Baratheon's daughters must appear only in episode 10. This is relevant because when they cast the first daughter, we pointed out we're not sure if this is necessarily indicating that we will see the first battle at Storm's End. Maybe they'll make an early cameo at the royal court. Maybe Boros will bring his daughters to the public wedding of Aegon II and Helena, which is just another background event. And that is still possible. I need to stress that. But we are now 90% sure that this is ending with the dance at Storm's End, particularly because they want to end with a big action climax to hook in new viewers. I mean, you do need something like that. And I've talked about in other videos, it makes sense in argument for end with a big action hook. And the dance at Storm's End is this really good cliffhanger. Of we've drawn first blood in the Civil War. That we've, the big debate we've been having is, will they stretch out the story into season two so the actual war and King Viserys' death don't happen until the end of season two? Because when you look at the Rogue Prince novella, they kind of skip over a whole decade of the 120s. That we know that Lena's funeral, which happens in 120, is in episode seven. We know this from casting reports. So there was a question of, well, with only three episodes, there's other stories they might want to tell. But the other thing is, I think they want to hook the audience in. They don't think an audience would stay unless they got dragon versus dragon battles within the first season. And I sympathize with that. I'm not even that upset about it because, um, again, I said this last time, unlike Benioff and Weiss, these people are not afraid to do flashbacks. That When Benioff said flashbacks are lazy, and then later admitted, well, I don't like to do flashbacks because I'm bad at them. I can't keep track of timelines. That's just because you're incompetent. 
Uh, think about other shows that use flashbacks, like uh, The Walking Dead or other stuff, where you might have a whole episode that's mostly flashback. That they might do the time skip from episode 7 in the year 120 to Viserys' death nine years later. And originally I suggest, well, maybe most of season 2 could be in chronological order covering what happens in the 120s, that uh, Corliss's younger brother tries to usurp him and his grandchildren, that Cregan Stark, a lot of it would be Stark and Lannister stuff, it would be Cregan Stark fighting his uncle who tried to usurp him, and Joanna Lannister, Joanna Westerling, dealing with her husband being unfaithful to her and having bastards, and just other stuff that was going on in the 120s. We don't necessarily lose that because these are new showrunners unafraid to use flashbacks, like maybe season two might not cover that much of the war. It might be mostly flashbacks and setup. Like if season one is devoted to introducing the Targaryens, my mental image is, what if season two ends with the battle at Rook's Rest, which is another giant action climax. It feels like something would be the climax to a season. But then, well, what would we fill in the six or seven episodes before that with? Well, show them recruiting the other great houses, and we'd have like a full episode devoted to Cregan Stark, mostly in flashbacks, showing his backstory. Or a full episode mostly about Jane Aaron, introducing her backstory. And it's just, this would be unthinkable on Game of Thrones, but think like, I just keep thinking of the example of Walking Dead, because I've been watching recently, that sometimes when they introduce a new character, they'd have a, a full flashback episode just to give, okay, this is their backstory. They might do that on this show, and we can't rule that out. So it's, it's an even bigger guess, when will season two end, when this is a show that's unafraid to, I wouldn't say pad out, but devote most of a season to flashbacks when they're still setting up new characters, then advance the storyline. I have no idea when season two will end. It's possible it'll end with Rook's rest, and most of the season will be flashbacks introducing all the other side characters, which is a good way of doing that. I'm not sure, but yeah, they would want to hook people in with the dance at Storm's End, the first dragon versus dragon fight. It's possible that isn't true. It's possible they end with Aegon the Second's wedding or something. I doubt it, that they would want to end with something like that. There's a few specifics about these castings for the daughters that raise questions, that they didn't bother to assign the first one a name, though maybe just because it was a code name, they didn't want to, maybe Mandy.com doesn't want to give out her name, but Spotlight is okay with saying, oh yeah, she's Ellen Baratheon, the second one, by Laura Lake. There's four Baratheon daughters in the books, some of these might be merged. Oldest to youngest, there's Cassandra, who's the eldest one and therefore heir to Storm's End. Morris is the smart one. The youngest is Floris, but the third daughter, Ellen, it's just, well, it's a middle child syndrome. And I said in the video on the first daughter, you could basically merge Ellen with Floris and it would be the same story. And I wouldn't blame them for that. They're not really developed in the source material that much. Raising the question of... At first, I jumped to, wow, that this one is named Ellen, the most obscure one. They're probably casting all four. It's possible they just thought Ellen was a better name. So maybe this is Maris, but they decided to call her Ellen because it's a, it's a more, it rolls off the tongue easier for a general audience. I don't mind renaming characters if they think it's a better name. Like uh, with the phrase, they made a condensation character of, there's, Black Walder Frey and Walder Rivers are two separate characters in the books who they combined into Black Walder Rivers. They call him Black Walder because he's really evil. Uh, but that isn't a problem when you're merging names like that. So just because this one is called Ellen, the least notable daughter, maybe they thought Ellen was a better name than Morris or Floris. So that it might not sync up, the name might not sync up with the character description, you understand. And it might be, you know, really reduced as a character to just a glorified stand-in. That leads me to the other half of this, that the actresses they've cast are not major dramatic actors. They're mostly background actors. I mean, the, the one they cast, the first one, Emma O'Hara, she hasn't really been in major roles. And looking at the background on Laura Lake, who is Ellen Baratheon, she's mostly a stunt woman. But when you look at what the stunt work is, she's a trained dancer. 
that she's actually been on a lot of shows as a background performer in, like, ballroom dancing scenes. She was actually a featured extra on Bridgerton during one of the ballroom dancing scenes on Bridgerton. So that sort of thing. And we've seen from other casting reports, they are hiring a lot of professional dancers to work on this show. Leading us to think that... I, I keep thinking of the example of uh, Natalie Dormer's old show, The Tudors. They're going to have a lot of ballroom dance scenes like The Tudors did, which makes sense. Game of Thrones didn't really have ballroom dancing scenes in the books that much. By comparison, they mention in the text... Viserys, it was this age of prosperity, he was always holding feasts and balls and dances, and there's fan art of this, that there should be ballroom dance scenes at the prosperous court of Viserys, we'd expect that. Emma Darcy, they're actually a, a, a trained uh, Ciroc dancer, so a lot of people on this have dance training, so we're going to get some dance scenes in some capacity, but the one thing we really know about Laura Lake is mostly a featured extra who is a trained dancer. And starting to branch out into other stunt work, mostly that. So there's some there's some debate over maybe they'd introduce the Baratheon sisters during a hunting scene and they're out riding, but then again, everyone rides on this show. So no, I think it, it's stunt stuff because they're going to have like a ballroom dance or something, or maybe they're introducing Amon to them that Boros holds a small dance for them just as a social meeting. While, while they're waiting around d discussing everything. Other idea that some people have raised is maybe they are introduced not at Storm's End. This, this doesn't 100% confirm that we're seeing the dance at Storm's End. Maybe they're going to be introduced at a royal ball that Viserys holds in, like, episode 8. Like, the wedding feast of Aegon II might be a good opportunity to introduce... These are the Baratheon sisters. And the fact that there'd be a dance scene for something like that, it probably indicates probably King's Landing and not Storm's End. I'm 90% we're going to see Storm's End because we had this other leak from that I talked about from reliable reporters who other fan sites trust gave an unconfirmed report verbally that we saw Rhaenyra's coronation scene. We don't have spy photos to confirm that. And I made a whole video on that, but I think that was a real leak. If that's true, as it probably is, if we have Lena and Lenor's death in Episode 7, they'd have three episodes to get through the death of Viserys, the Green Council, and then Rhaenyra's crowning. Would all probably be one episode. I went back and checked. Like, the Rogue Prince is all one chapter in Fire and Blood, turned into the chapter Heirs of the Dragon. Then there's a whole chapter devoted to the death of Viserys, ending with Rhaenyra's crowning, but it's mostly dialogue, whereas there's 30 years worth of time skips in the chapter on the reign of Viserys. His death up to Rhaenyra's crowning, you read it and go, this is a full chapter, but it would translate into one episode, because it's mostly dialogue and exposition. Then the third chapter after that covers, this is before the actual fighting starts in the war, it covers that they sent uh, the older son, Jake, north, and they sent the younger son, Luke, south. They sent uh, Jake to go treat with the Starks and Aarons to get them on their side. They sent Luke to the Baratheons, and then they had the first dragon versus dragon fight of the war. I'm not sure. Tell me in the comments, how would you fit that into three episodes, eight, nine, and ten? Would they have one episode devoted to the intervening period after Lena's death, but before Viserys' death? Something brief is showing young Cregan fighting his uncle for episode 8. Or uh, the Valarians fighting each other. And that's that other interesting thing I noticed. That I said, something weird is going on in episode 8. Because it is the only episode directed by Gita Patel. There's four directors this season. The other three are doing three episodes each. And Gita is doing exactly one. And she's better known for doing documentary work and travel stuff. I know this is speculation, but in my head I wondered, would they give her like a travel episode juggling multiple locations? Like 20 minutes on, this is what's happening in Winterfell during a 10-year stretch between Lena's funeral and Viserys' death. And then a 20-minute section in the middle on, 
and this is Jane Aaron fighting off her relatives, and then another 20-minute section on, and this is the Valarians fighting each other with the, the younger brother, Vaymond, that I get the sense that Episode Eight might have a, a montage of several subplots covering a decade-long time span. This is how I would do it if I was given three episodes. Doesn't mean they're going to do it. Then Episode Nine would be Viserys' death through the crownings, then episode 10 would mostly be focused on the dance at Storm's End in the opening fight of the war. I'm not necessarily sure that they're going to... It's, that's what's forming in my mind. There is a question of would blood and cheese happen, because it's, it's shorter, but, and they are setting up Mizaria. They might do blood and cheese in the same episode, but I doubt it, just because of time. I mean, they could cram it in, I'd rather they don't. Because it, it's a, a worse... I think that would frighten people away from watching season two. The blood and cheese assassination is one of the darkest... Everyone keeps bringing it up as the darkest assassination in this entire story. That as much as we have a dark Ned Stark execution moment or a red wedding moment, people have read this say we don't really have one in this, but if I had to say what's the darkest point, it would be the blood and cheese assassination. Because you're killing a kid. So just... Due to a combination of time and you don't want to scare off people from watching season two, I don't think they'll get through Blood and Cheese. And even people on the forums and stuff are going, they'd have to cram it in to get just the dance over Storm's End. You'd have to introduce a lot of characters really fast, much less have time left over to do Blood and Cheese, so I doubt that. And again, the list of directors here I'm certain on, and I've noted as best I can in the chart... All right, this is speculative, but this we know from spy photos. We think Rainier's coronation has been filmed, but have no spy photos to prove it. And this casting information very strongly indicates that, yeah, they'll probably end with the dance over Storm's End. And if we're worried about, will they cut out a lot of exposition in the 120s, keep in mind, there's always flashbacks. That they're unafraid of flashbacks. I mean, look how many flashbacks The Witcher Season 1 had, you know? Maybe they'll set up Cregan and uh, Stark and Jane Aaron and Joanna Westerling. Maybe you'll see more of their background as flashbacks in early season two. That That's a good way to do it while keeping everything at a good pace in season one. So I'm really backlogged on all this other information that came out for the schedule. But this casting info just came out and just, we already knew, well, if she's a Boros Baratheon daughter in, in a Greg Yatani's episode, she has to be in episode 10. She could be in no other episode, and that very strongly points to the first dragon versus dragon fight of the war. But I'm backlogged on all the other news that came out. I've been sick for the past week, if you can't tell, I'm still, I'm still recovering. A lot of other stuff and podcasts that the showrunner gave talking about behind-the-scenes info and their, their schedule. So please like and subscribe if you want to stay updated on all this backlogged info. There's Even though exterior filming has stopped, there's still a lot of stuff to report on, because more was coming out than, than we were able to keep pace with.